Today on Anytime Talk Radio, we have a great show. We have Matt Shea. Um, as with some radio shows that come along, you just have problems, whether it's cell phone dropping, which we did in this interview, um, or equipment um, failing. We had two recorders going. One gave me an error, and I didn't realize it and didn't record. And I had no idea that the power um, just died. And so we're taking about a 20 or 25 minute interview and knocking it down to about 10, maybe 15 minutes here at the most. I apologize for that, but those things do happen, and that can be very frustrating. But um, as you'll hear in the interview here with Matt Shea, uh, you know, we have to be get ready um, with things that are happening here in our country and that things are not going to always be like they always are and always have been. And so um, definitely highly recommend that you get out there. Um, definitely check out uh, Radio Free Readout. That's up in Idaho with John Jacob Schmidt, um, Amron. Um, that's with um, the ham radio operators getting together uh, nationwide so that when the cell phones and everything else goes down, we have communication between patriots and people that are willing to stand for God in that um, because we're going to need communications here in these last days. Um, so, hey, I got my technician license in ham radio, so I recommend that if you can get out there, um, if you're not sure how to get on there, um, go to uh, you can go to... Um, Amazon and get their booklet, uh, the official booklet. You can also go on eHam, um, and for like twenty bucks, it takes you through a whole, the whole technician class, and of course the general and then the extra. Um, but what it does, it basically knows what areas you're weak in, and so definitely get into eHam, and that'll get you set up so that, um, like maybe the last week before I took the test, I really hit onto it really hard, and so when I took the test, um, it's thirty five questions out of three hundred. And I don't know how many I missed, but you have to a passing of 26. So 26 questions out of 35 you have to get right. And, um, of course, um, once you get into it, um, definitely ask a lot of questions and find out what you want in radio um, because you don't want to go out and just buy something out there. Now, uh, if you go to Amron, they have the bail thing out there. I have not bought one yet, still looking and getting questions answered. But definitely ask people in the ham radio um, field. They can give you ideas on what you can get. Um, but um, definitely start getting your communications up with what's happening here. Um, we're doing our best out here. And so, anyways, we'll be up right next with uh, Matt Shea. Welcome to End Time Talk Radio. We have a great show. For 30 minutes, we have Representative Matt Shea, the 4th District of Washington State of Spokane Valley. Now, we've had him on before, and there's some things that have been happening down there, like in Nevada with the Bundy Ranch and other things that have been happening. Uh, Matt Shea was actually down there. Matt, well, actually, what was going on in the Bundy Ranch? Well, there was a lot of things going on at the Bundy Ranch. Uh, and it's very interesting how the media portrayed that, but let me start really quick with the law. So, a lot of people have been hearing conflicting things in the media, but here's the bottom line. Mm, I think we just lost you. So, there's something in Western water law called first in time, first in right. And what that means in the West is if you had a water right, and you were first in time, you were first in right, and it was a preemptive water right, then last in line to be cut off if water had to be cut off or, or rationed. You would be the last in line for that to happen. So it was a preeminent right. Well, if Clive and Bundy had a adjudicated preemptive water right, somebody's going to probably ask you, what, what does adjudicated mean? All that means is that they went to court, it was adjudicated specifically what amount of water he could draw off at any given time for his cattle. So this was, this was a preemptive right. And it's adjudicated. So that's the first thing to understand. They have some people say, well, he didn't pay his grazing fees. Mm -hmm. Well, in a separate federal court decision called U.S. v. Hage, U.S. v. Wayne Hage, Judge Robert Jones wrote a 104-page opinion that specifically said, if you have a water right, if you have a corresponding right for your cattle to forage within half mile of that water source. So... I didn't hear that talked about in the media, and USDH was also out of Nevada, was also concerning the BLM and the Forest Service, was during the same time period, mm -hmm. same subject matter of cattle grazing, and that's what a federal court judge ruled. So Mr. Bunny was well within his rights to have his cattle near those water sources, first. Second, 
the BLM was charged with managing the land. And one of the reasons that the Bundy family did not pay those grazing fees, and I would have to have advised them to do the same, was because they would have acknowledged what the BLM wanted them to do in the 1990s, early 1990s, and that was to reduce his cattle herd from 900 to 150 cattle. On top of that, the BLM was using those fees from the ranchers not to manage the land, and let me be specific about that means. Managing the land means you keep up the stock water tanks, you keep up the, the infrastructure, the fences, and all of that. They weren't doing that. What they were doing was using that money to turn around and buy the ranchers out of their water rights and their property rights and drive them all away. And the only one that didn't sell out was Clive and Bundy. So there's many different reasons that he shouldn't have paid those grazing fees. And he actually tried to pay those grazing fees to the county to manage the, the stock water tanks, et cetera, but they didn't do it. So that's the first thing that everybody needs to know about that in the Nevada situation is that he had water rights to that land and had a corresponding forage right to that land. It had already been ruled on by a federal judge. The yeah. next thing I think people need to know, if, if I may, is the, sure. the the federal government was operating contrary to federal law. And I know that might sound kind of funny to everybody listening, but yeah. that's that's a matter of fact. Congressman Steve Stockman brought out that 73 U.S.C., and I cannot remember the end, end of that citation, but requires the BLM in any enforcement action to rely on local law enforcement, quote, to the maximum extent possible. That didn't happen in this case, so they were in direct violation of federal statute. On top of that, the court order said for them to seize the cattle. It didn't say anything about killing the cattle, which happened. Sixteen cattle were killed, including two of his prized bulls. And one of them apparently was shot from a helicopter based on the evidence that I've seen. And they also went in and destroyed those stock water tanks and everything else. So they were in direct violation of that federal court order. And not only that, what should really alarm Americans is that they dug a mass grave for the cattle, not just the 16 that they killed, but for the other 300. This mass grave was large enough for the rest of the cattle that they had already seized at that point in time. Hmm. So the federal government was in direct violation of the court order and, and apparently in direct violation of federal law. And I just sum all of this up that a sniper rifle is not due process. And the fact that these guys pointed a sniper rifle at American citizens is just reprehensible. We have got to demilitarize these bureaucrats because clearly not only will they overreach, but they will use guns to enforce what they believe is their duty, and that's to impoverish and drive off the land of rural America. Matt, it was once said that um, with the Jewish people, when when were they supposed to take a stand against the Nazis? And one person actually had wrote a book, and I think I might have heard this from a show that you had done, or somebody on the caliber basically said when our neighbors started getting attacked, that's when we should have stood up. Yeah, there's a there's a great, uh, great writer named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was a uh, a Russian who stood up to Stalin and was sent off to the Gulag. And in his book, Gulag Archipelago, uh, pages 15 and 16, he asked that same question, at what point should we have resisted? Oh, how we burned in the trains. At what point should we have resisted? And he came up with the answer. If you can imagine, I mean, he's going to the Gulag on the train, doesn't know if he's going to live. He came up with the answer that, it was when they came to take our neighbor's stuff. Mm-hmm. And and I think that I think that goes exactly and dovetails in exactly what you're saying. It, it's when it's clearly acting outside the law. And I don't know if they were for Harry Reid's crony friends. I don't know if they were doing it for some other detail you know, uh, deal that they made. I don't know if they were doing it just to uh, for radical environmentalism and just to drive people off the land. But what I do know is that that was unconstitutional and it was against existing federal law and we don't govern at the point of a gun in America. Well, that's true. Did you get to meet a chance to uh, meet Clive and Bundy? I did, yes. I talked to him and um, we talked about several things and he's, you know, his son actually is the one that said to me, uh, Ammon Bundy, that... Uh, you know, this really restored its faith in the American people because not only 
when I, I put out the call with uh, Stuart Rhodes of Oath Keepers and Sheriff Mack of the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officer Association for people to come there, not only did people show up there, but people inside the federal government, Barry, mm -hmm. inside the federal government were giving us intelligence on what was actually happening because they didn't believe that American citizens should ever have that happen to them, and they were actually keeping their oath even though they could have lost their jobs helping us out. Wow, that you know that is way too cool. Now that almost tells me that God is doing something on the inside to bring the hearts of people close to Him in a situation that's right now that's wrong in the people. Absolutely, and one of the great things that happened down there is we opened our meetings in prayer. We opened our press conference in prayer when we were down there, and it, 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 and not just the drone thing is that the government went to all of this effort. I mean, they were trying to collect a $200,000 bill, and they spent a million dollars to send all these people in here and do all of this, when all they had to do in court, every attorney knows this, was to file a lien in court. Mm -hmm. That's all they had to do, on the cattle or on his ranch. That's all they had to do. But instead they chose this very heavy hand of strategy with malice or forethought. So everybody should be alarmed that, yeah, government is capable of it. So even if this doesn't pan out to be true, this warning about the use of drones on the Bundy property. The fact that the government spent that much money and that much time and that much effort to go after an American citizen, I think, should alarm everybody. I mean, that, and so I, I believe that they would be capable of using drones on American soil, and I, I also believe that they would be capable of indefinitely detaining American citizens, especially after the Supreme Court decision yesterday that said that the United States military could, could detain an American citizen uh, without any due process, without any trial as an enemy combatant if they were considered a danger to the country, you know, which is uh, yeah, amazing. True. You know, and we've been fighting the federal government here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and they're trying to take things from us here, too. Not on the caliber of Clive and Bundy, but we do see things happening. They're trying to do that. Now, it's true, government closest to the people is best, and if we have a government that's close that are willing to stand, we can actually throw off the federal government's um, infringement, infringement. Well, I think, you know, the big lesson out of this entire thing was that when Americans stand on principle, under God, on principle, don't waver, stand together and united, we win. I mean, that should encourage everybody, and... You know, the final check and balance in our system, according to the Founding Fathers, was a well-armed people. And, you know, clearly when it came to it, um, there were folks willing to, to die for freedom and liberty. And I have to applaud all that those courageous people that were down there, uh, because that, to me, is what America is all about. You know, you're willing to lay your life on the line, not just for your family and yourself, but also your, your neighbor and your friend, because you know that this isn't an isolated incident with the Bundys. It's, gonna, it's happened in... North Idaho with the Sackett family. It's happened in eastern Washington with Bill Demers and our Department of Ecology. It's happened in the Red River and on the Texas-Oklahoma border. So people know that it, if they come for your neighbor, they're going to come for you eventually. And I think that's one of the big, huge lessons. We stand united together like this. We win. Um, what about Wyoming? Did you get any late, uh, state legislators out your way to help out? Well, one of the things that, you know, the next step is, uh, we put together a five-point strategy uh, from uh, the coalition, and we formed the Coalition of Western States, COWS. you got to love that acronym. And <laughs> the, the, the state legislators are now on board from, we have state legislators on board from Utah, from Oklahoma, from Oregon, from Montana, from Idaho, from Washington, from New Mexico, and from Arizona. And uh, we're continuing to grow. I haven't heard anything from uh, Wyoming yet, uh, but... Our five-point strategy is very simple. It's using the American Lands Council. You can you can check them out online, but the American Lands American Lands Council has put together a great process by which we can transfer federal land back to the state. And the, the second part is once you do that, you have to sell some of that to private entities uh, based on most of the enabling acts that brought the states in the West into the Union. And so... That, I think, is really, really key. Uh, and it's also key to understand, too, that Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution very clearly says that the federal government can only own land, that it's purchased from the state, and then it limits what that purchase can be for, dockyards, military forts, 
arsenals, magazines, and needful buildings. So very clear that the United States government does not own that land based on the U.S. Constitution. The question is who controls it. So this first process of transferring it to the states and then selling to uh, private entities is, is, I think, one of the key things that has to happen. The next thing that has to happen, number three, is that we have to have county commissioners at the local level form land use management plans and then demand coordination with the federal government on everything that will affect that land management plan. And uh, that's outlined in great detail at americanstewards.org, americanstewards.org. And that will put the brakes on all of these things they're doing. So if the EPA comes in, they have to coordinate with the local county commissioners, and that local land use plan, that wins out. So that's a, a critical component of this. The next component, number four, is very simply that these local jurisdictions need to pass resolutions backing their sheriff to require any federal agents doing enforcement action as part of these bureaucracies in the local counties must come through the sheriff's office and the county commissioners are going to back them. I think that's another very key component of all this. Yeah, um, yeah. Last but not least, we have to demand the disarming of the federal bureaucrats and the bureaucracies that have militarized. We have to demand that they be disarmed. So that's the five points that we're working on with the Coalition of Western States and and I uh, really appreciate uh, you having me on here today to talk about those issues. Yeah, you know, it's really exciting. You know that you know we're seeing that God is on the people's side if they're willing to stand up. Um, do you see the church starting to stand up with the people? Well, yeah. One of the great stories that didn't make the media was we had pastors down there too. We had uh, Chuck Baldwin, pastor of Liberty Fellowship up in uh, Kalispell, Montana, and we had uh, Pastor Barry and Ann Bird uh, from Northeast Washington down there. So yeah, there are some churches that are starting to wake up. But I would just tell all your listeners, if you've got a pastor that does not preach from the Bible and does not preach about freedom and liberty or is afraid to talk about the issues of the day, you may want to think about leaving that church. Um, obviously pray about it, but you may want to think about leaving that church and going to a church that does, because uh, we're at a point in time where freedom and liberty is going to be acted on outside of the church walls. In fact, I think Christianity demands that we act outside the church walls in our charitable giving and showing love to others, but also in protecting our friends and neighbors and their rights and freedoms as well. Man, I can't agree with you enough. Uh, of course, I've told you before, the pastor we have, he's willing to stand for freedom and liberty. He's like a Chuck Baldwin down in Greeley, Colorado. Um, but you know, it's so hard to find people that are willing to stand up as pastors nowadays. It, it really is, and but, you know, the great thing with the Internet is you can tune in to Chuck Baldwin's service. I'm sure your pastor puts stuff online. So there's no real excuse not to be tuning in and learning from these pastors that will talk about freedom and liberty in the Bible. And that's really exciting. Um, so, uh, Matt, what's going to happen next? What do you, what's the foreseeable feature, feature? Well, clearly, clearly at the highest levels, they wanted to make an example of Clive and Bundy. And that didn't work. So they're not going to take kindly to being poked in the eye. And I would expect this is going to, this issue is going to show up somewhere else. Um, we are organizing right now uh, what we call a tyranny response team for when that mm. does eventually happen. And I think that, you know, the, the folks need, just need to be tuned in to shows like yours and on the Internet because when this happens again, uh, we need to be ready. We can't, we just can't sit on our laurels and, and uh, go back to sleep. We need to stay awake and make sure we defend freedom and liberty, liberty especially throughout the West of the United States. The, the last time we had you on, you talked about the eight points. We won't have you do that now. But I know that when I heard you on some other radio shows, you really um, were ex uh, telling people to get out there and get fit for because you can't help your neighbor if they're not fit. Yeah, you've got to get fit. you got to learn how to shoot and to handle firearms properly. Um, I just think it's just a basic thing of being an American. It, it, it actually gives you the the confidence to remain free, and I think it frees your mind as well. But, uh, you know, the big thing, too, is make sure you've got enough food and water and, and uh, enough medical supplies, communications as well to withstand, because not just for you and your family, but also your friends and neighbors, because it's a great opportunity as a Christian to reach out 
preach the gospel and, and do it in love and in a crisis when people are going to be looking around saying, what just happened? And you can point them toward the cross of Jesus Christ. What an opportunity. One of the things I've been trying to endeavor into is ham radio. I just got my technician license, and so when communications do go down, I want to have a way to communicate with people to find out what is going on. Yeah, I think ham radio is a great way to do that. Obviously, Amron and John Jacob Smith and mm-hmm. and the whole readout uh, radio network. I think it's a great uh, a great place to start on the web and learn how to do that and and get yourself trained up. It's it's such a key thing to be able to communicate because you might have all the food and water and everything else, but unless you can't talk to other people, it kind of makes things very difficult. Sure. You know, I know how busy you are. Uh, any final thoughts you want to leave the people before we let you go? Well, if uh, if folks get a chance, they can check out uh, me on Facebook at Matt Shea. They can also take a look at Freedom Agenda Washington, take a look at what we've been doing here in Washington State, and maybe get their local state legislators and county commissioners on board. They can also take a look at uh, the Coalition of Western States, which is uh, on the web, and it's also on Facebook. So thanks again, Barry, for having me, and God bless you. And Everybody uh, everybody really appreciates you, so thanks for having me on again.